Lynn's birthday today. Oh. Ah. talk about growing up and waking up. Uh, many of you know that that's a phrase that Ken Wilbur has used. Just to get some sense, how many people are familiar with integral and um, adult developmental theory, at least to some degree? Okay, so there's still some people that, that it's new to. So, well, I'll try not to bore those of you who know it, you know, like the back of your hand and yet um, not be too, you know, complicated for those who don't. If, if I'm going too much in one direction, let me know. Um, and I'll try to change. Um, so one of the things that's, that came to our attention is the fact that there are people running around now desperately trying to wake up. Uh, they're going to gurus and they're looking for transmission and they're doing everything they can to you know, somehow get themselves into this enlightened state, um, which is fine. I mean, that's, that's a great thing. But they're ignoring, many of them, the other side of the equation, which is growing themselves up developing greater maturity, greater sanity, greater balance, uh, a greater container to hold whatever experience it is that they're looking for. Um, so what I want to do today is emphasize that growing up side and show that in fact how necessary it is uh, for the waking up side. And then Jose is going to um, talk about the skills of meditation uh, which is the primary way one can develop both of these sides, and how they relate to this, this developmental um, model that we're going to be talking about. Um, so first of all, I want to say that there, there is adult development. People believed for a long time, you got to 21, you were done, that was it, you never got any further. But anybody over 35 knew that wasn't true. <laughs> they could look at 21-year-olds and themselves and see that they had a much greater breadth of understanding than they had had when they were younger. And that continues. Um, so we know a lot about children's development, Piaget, but most people don't seem to know a lot about adult development, uh, unless you've been involved with Wilbur and the developmentalists. But in the last 30 to 40 years, there's been a huge amount of research done on adult development. And it's very clear there are defined stages. Wilbur was one of the first to take many people's work and pull it together. But others have been working since then. Um, and the person I'm going to be talking about today has combined his work with Suzanne Cook Reuter's work, if any of you know her, and moved a step beyond. Uh, she's coming out with a book in the fall. Wilbur's writing the preface to it. So he sees it as a great you know, next step to his work as well. Um, so it's a huge topic. And we can't obviously cover the whole thing. Um, but I wanted, what I want to do is to talk about um, the process of human development and give you an experience both from the inside and from the outside. As, you know, so we're going to look at it, but we're also going to try to go inside and, and see what that feels like. So um, growing up, growing up is about cognitive development. Uh, this is why a lot of people think, oh, it's boring, it's heady, <laughs> that sort of thing, it's just cognitive. But cognitive development is an increasing ability to take perspectives. So it's not just about head things, it's about trying to understand the world better. It's about managing greater and greater complexity. And it's about working with wider and wider time frames and spatial contexts. So you start out with a very you know, limited Want, you know, first-person perspective, I see what I see and I know I'm right and that's all there is. Um, until you get to realize, wait a minute, there are more perspectives. I don't like them, but there are more of them. Um, and then you get to see the value in several, and then you begin to be able to hold multiple perspectives yourself. And the time frame goes from, you know, a couple of years or something like that to, you know, seeing into one's children's children's generation, that kind of thing. Um, and also growing up is about the self-development, ego development, so how we see ourselves. We go from seeing ourselves as concrete bodies in a world of other bodies to subtle minds 
in a world of other minds, to awareness in a world of awareness, and then finally to all of this at once. Um, we also, um, growing up involves moral development. It means uh, moving from someone who is very self-centered to somebody who is able to care for others, to somebody who can care for the whole world, world-centric consciousness, and then somebody who, in fact, is the cosmos and therefore naturally works for the good of all. And there are several other domains. As you know, there are multiple ones, but those are the three primary ones. Um, Cindy Wigglesworth, who some of you have, may have come across, she's written a book called Spiritual Intelligence. She talks about the development of nobility, uh, acquiring characteristics such as peacefulness, kindness, courage, and wisdom. So uh, waking up, on the other hand, is about going within. Growing up is really about managing in the outside world. Waking up and, and the, your inner psyche. But waking up is about going much deeper, going in, finding spirit within, uh, developing connection to God, and becoming aware of and awake to ultimate reality. So why is growing up first easier than waking up? Um, the problem can come when you wake up first and you've had very little experience. You have a very narrow framework. You have a very short time span. You have only one perspective, things like that. And these strange experiences come into your consciousness. So what do you do? They're frightening. If, if for many people, they're frightening. Uh, many people want to shove them out because they don't fit with their view of what life is like. They don't have a container for these kinds of you know, visions or vibrations or whatever experiences they may have. Um, they're not used to having a lack of control. They want to control everything. This experience is something they can't control. Um, and we can have other problems like the ego hijacking the experience. So the person gets an overblown. It's not God who's waking up through me. I'm awake. Mm -hmm. So, um, Or the self can disappear. People can experience depersonalization, loss of identity, and get confused. They can fear they're going crazy. So a lot of things like that can happen to people. If you grow up, however, people at a higher stage, when they have these experiences, have a much easier time with them. So many of you see, have seen this Wilbur Combs lattice. This is about waking up on this axis, axis and growing up on this one. And you can see Wilbur uses the terms archaic, magic, mythic, rational, pluralistic, integral, super integral. We're not going to worry about those terms right now because there are others that are used and it, it can get confusing. And then waking up, we can have awareness of gross reality. We can have awareness of subtle reality, the world inside our minds. Awareness of causal reality, and then awareness of non-dual reality. So, um, you go from really a physical and emotional way of dealing with the world to a mental and then a heart-centered way of dealing with the world, and then an awareness way of dealing with the world. Um, and then you go to where there's really no personal focus at all. Um, So with, this is what we talked about, the, the, the push to wake up. Um, in addition to being seen as too heady, people can toss off shadow work is unnecessary. Oh, I've seen the light. I don't need to work on myself anymore. Uh, but everything is still going on. You're still here in a personality. So whatever internal experience you have, you've still got a body and you encounter other bodies. And you have a mind and you encounter other minds. So... Uh, in addition to feeling lost or frightened or out of control, you can also go into a spiritual bypass. Many, many of you may have heard this term, uh, where it becomes unnecessary to deal with real life. You just live in, you know, this modern version of a cave. Um, <laughs> or you can have this experience and then lose the experience and become devastated. Um, and, you know, like, where did it go and why can't I get it back? And I had this unity and I had this beauty and... And now it's, now it's gone. Um, but if you can grow up first, and then you have experiences like that, 
you have several benefits. One of them is there's less of a gap between your spiritual reality and your ordinary reality. As you, you'll see when we go through these tiers, people at the higher levels can encompass a much greater amount of experience as normal because it's actually closer to their ordinary life. Um, people who have grown know that they are in control. They're aware of that they can't control everything. So when a lack of control comes, it's easier to deal with. There's a comfort with paradox and uncertainty and higher stages. And there's a, an ability to navigate the dis- difference between this internal beautiful world and this really crazy, chaotic, difficult world out there. Um, and, and you have this container also for unusual experiences. And two more you have is the, you have a better ability of stabilizing the experience. So if you have an experience and you don't have this container, it tends to be more fleeting. Uh, later on, when you've developed through the stages and you have an experience, it's more solid. It stays with you or it can. And also, just by growing up, you have a better ability to find joy and peace in this world. So many of you have seen this. Um, I know it's too small to read, but I just want to uh, mention these are Wilbur's stages of development over here. And these are uh, Lovingers and Cook Reuters here. And so Terry O'Fallon, who we'll be talking about, has taken usually the terms from this model and but gone as far as Ken has with his model. Um, so the stages that she has here are symbiotic, impulsive, self-protected, protective conformist, conscientious, individualistic, autonomous, integrated, construct aware, ego aware, and then um, beyond, and now Terry has drawn from Ken's stages at the very top. So she's really taken those two models and looked at them very, very closely. So she began to see, she, instead of taking the, the Wilbur Combs axis, which was on its side, she turned it into a B um, and, and became interested in the area under this line. So let's say somebody had witnessed consciousness, but they had only grown to the achiever stage. This is kind of where they were. Another person might have strategist consciousness, but only subtle awakening, and this is where they were. So it's an interesting way of seeing how people relate to each other. For instance, here, the green area would be the area where people could relate, two different people who had two different types of development. But as she looked at this further, she saw that the people at the lower levels of development were dealing with concrete things. And the people at these levels were dealing with subtle things. And people beyond that, up here, were dealing with causal things. So she took this model that she has now as a B, and she collapsed it into one thing. Um, And her title of one of her papers is Growing Up is Waking Up. So I'm going to show how she um, did that and how she looked at it. So she has four tiers. The concrete tier, which corresponds if you think of Wilbur up to about blue. Um, so that would be uh, beige, purple, um, red, and blue would be in the concrete tier. Then in the subtle tier, that she's added a couple of stages. There are four stages in each one of these tiers. Um, but the upper uh, tiers here are <coughs> orange, green, and, um, and uh, teal in this subtle level. So, um, and she has, a, she has an extra one in here. And then in the causal tier, that starts with turquoise. Um, and then the non-dual is beyond that. So the concrete tier is about the material world, about learning to manage in a world of objects that are exterior to ourselves. So I'm an object, and I have to relate to all of you objects out there somehow. I have to figure out how to do that. Um, the subtle is... I begin to realize, wait a minute, I've got an interior. I have thoughts, I have feelings, I have emotions. How do I deal with those? What are those? So the shift from tier to tier is a big jump for people. Um, They've gone from dealing with concrete objects, and all of a sudden they realize they have this interior. So it's a bit shaky. 
And then they gradually realize, wait a minute, other people have one too. So I can relate to them. They have thoughts and they have feelings and I do too. So we can work together and we can understand this. So we get increasingly, until that is now normal. You know, it's completely normal to do that kind of thing. The causal tier is another huge jump when all of a sudden everything that you thought again kind of changes and awareness comes in, an awareness of everything. And it tends to flood consciousness. And there's this like, what's going on here kind of feeling. Um, so we're going to go into detail on some of those. Uh, but I think there's a, an interesting thing I just read about, which is in the Middle Ages, there were Christian saints who could read without moving their lips. And this was regarded as miraculous because nobody thought there was an interior space where you could hold these thoughts as you were reading. So the fact that somebody could read with their mouth shut seemed like a real miraculous thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, in fact, this, this sense of an inner world has really, in the 20th century, the development of psychology and the real focus in on that has made us aware of it in a way that we were not before. Um, the witness stage is about awareness of awareness, um, being aware of our minds and our emotions as objects, watching them parade by kind of dispassionately from a witness stance. Um, and about experiencing emptiness and fullness as a daily lived experience. And then the non-dual is about integrating all of these concrete, subtle, causal, everything and nothing, all in us. And also these people who are at that level live that as a daily experience. So it's the same person, it's just the concept of the self expands. So I want to take a little trip through the concrete here. So I'm going to ask you, oops, how do I do this? Alt. 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 OK. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm just going to talk for about five minutes. And I'd like if you just close your eyes and relax. <clears throat> So I want to uh, ask you to just think of yourself as a newborn. And you're suddenly thrust into a world of light and sound, movement, discomfort. You don't know what anything is. You don't even really see objects. You see shadows of light and dark, colors, shapes, but none of it has any meaning to you. You lie in your crib near a window, but you don't see a window because you don't have any concept of a window. There are vertical lines and horizontal lines and colors and shapes. You don't distinguish the peck spectrum of color into colors because no one has taught you that yet. You don't know what is moving as a curtain or a person passing in front of the window. You don't know that what you feel is a mattress you don't see your mobile as different from your hand as it moves into your field of vision. You are just mesmerized by all this explosion of something. Gradually, you learn that your hand is part of you. It hurts if you bite it. The crib rail is not. You see that certain things can be foregrounded and backgrounded. Later, you are given names for mommy and daddy and window and door and bottle and cracker and you begin to see them as distinct objects. Now, in a big leap of understanding, you realize you can manipulate these objects. You do something and they change. You can put something in your mouth and feel its texture. You can scream and mommy comes. You can drop the toy from your high chair and someone will pick it up and give it back to you. Over time, you get increasingly sophisticated about what you can do, build with blocks, push another child and get a reaction, hide behind a tree, eat with a knife and fork, climb over obstacles to get to something, beg for candy. Now you feel in control of your environment. You can bend it to your will. Whatever interferes with your autonomy, you try to annihilate. What a heady sensation. You can be this way for the rest of your life. See the world as all about you and what you want. Why not? You can continue to reach out, to take what you want, exert your power to overcome the obstacles, 
treat interference as something to be thrust aside. As you get bigger, you get more powerful and more <coughs> clever. You can do even more things to make things go your way. But probably you don't go on seeing the world this way. Probably you begin to see or get help to see that there are others in the world who also have wants, who need things, who don't want something to get in their way. You figure out that life goes better for you if you learn to interact with these beings. Give a little to get something back. Cooperate to get something done. Sometimes you get to be pretty good at this. Sometimes it's very hard to give up the idea of it's mine and I get to be the boss person. Sometimes you can feel that way even when you grow up to be an adult. Gradually, though, you get better at it, and it starts to feel normal to share, to reciprocate a kindness, to sometimes subordinate your will for the benefit of others. As a grown-up, you can take on a role like wife or husband or employee or neighbor. You can be a functional member of a community. If you're religious, you will most likely believe in a traditional God, a rule giver and monitor of human behavior, one who rewards the good and punishes the evil. You could have a New Age belief in a world of good and evil spirits and see the need to fend off the evil and cling to the good through non-traditional means such as incantations or fortune telling. Often, especially if you live in a culture that doesn't require much more than basic roles of you or that doesn't educate you behind, beyond high school, you will stay like this for the rest of your life, likely a respected member of your community, comfortable with your role and your increasing ability to navigate life. You will develop increasing sophistication and understanding of how to live in this world that you see and understand. Some things about modern life will seem too complicated and difficult to bother with, and you will try to avoid them, seeking out more simple, traditional, and concrete ways of being. But in another shift, likely, especially in Western culture, you will be asked to move beyond this level of understanding and begin to actively work with the norms and rules and roles you have been following. You begin to see how these norms and rules allow your community to flourish. You will become parts of groups of people who works with these norms. You have the capacity to run a meeting, participate in a town council, to articulate and explain your point of view. Belonging and social interaction is important to you, and you are most comfortable with people who are similar to you, whether in social situations, religious affiliation, economic status, marital status, or et cetera. You see the value of community and the importance of subordinating your own needs to the community. You are a good citizen. So I'm going to stop there for a minute. <coughs> so hopefully, you, as you went through that, you remember yourself at those stages, and you can find those parts of yourself still within you because it's always transcend and include. We bring everything along. So we, we still have that fits mind. <laughs> sometimes, and we still have the ability to follow rules and things like that. So now I want to kind of look at it from the outside uh, about what we were talking about. So here's our baby that comes into the world, just a total blank. Uh, this is called the instinctive <coughs> self in, in uh, Terry O'Fallon's model, or the in undifferentiated side, self. If, if an adult is at this stage, which is very rare, it's about survival, just finding food, sex, shelter. It's, it's kind of a tribal, almost hive-like existence for somebody like that. Um, and then they start to see, this is, you know, so what is this baby seeing? Until somebody says, oh, there's a tiger there. They don't see the tiger. Or somebody <laughs> says, wait a minute, it's a bunch of zebra. So the child is just open to really anything until they get told, so they get words for things. Same here, what the heck is that? You know, Nobody knows until they say, oh, it's a path and it's some leaves, and then they get, they get an understanding. So then we go to the next stage, <laughs> which is often called the opportunist. This one is the one who wants to win, is self-oriented and manipulative, believes that might makes right, my daddy can beat your daddy kind of thing. Um, it's also called impulsive, and there's a lot of magical thinking and superstition at this stage. Now, if you continue into an adult, uh, about 5% of adults are still at this stage. There's no sense of future and no sense of consequences. So why not take what you want? Not thinking about punishment. Uh, there's no sense of other, there's no responsibility to other people, no sense of, you know, maybe I'm taking something that somebody will miss or something like that. Uh, so we still find that in adults. 
Uh, the next stage, who we actually took down our label. <laughs> we may have all seen this picture. This is the role, role, or conventional self. These people know what is the right thing to do, and they intend to do it, and they also intend that everybody else around them do it. So they have a lot of shoulds governing their behavior. But also at this stage, we have the positive side, which is the ability to be part of a family and to take on the adult roles, conventional adult roles that people do. And people can enjoy that. They're a good parent, they're a good employee, you know, they're the backbone of our society in many ways. Uh, and we're good citizens at that stage. So the people who keep our country stable and functioning. Now, when we get to the last stage of the concrete, which is sometimes called the conformist or the diplomat, we now have the ability to plan. We can work with other people and develop fairly linear concrete plans to do something. We know how to teach. We can teach other people about the requirements of society, the rules, and that kind of thing. And we can work together, particularly on concrete things. So people in this conformist diplomat stage, they want to belong, they want to follow group norms, they want to enforce standards, they like to avoid overt conflict and bring people together. And about 12% of adults are in that stage. So 17% of adults are now in this or, or lower stages. Um, so now the next big leap, that was the concrete tier. Now there's a big jump into the subtle tier. The concrete is about becoming aware of your body, rules, and the creation of structures. But the subtle is about becoming aware of your interior and learning how to work with ideas and possibilities and the future. You become able to visualize something that isn't there, that could be there. Um, at each tier, we go through a new kind of awareness. We first realize this new thing is here. Then we learn how to manipulate it. Then we now learn how to share it with others. And then we learn how to act on it. And that will take us then to the next tier. So I want to do a similar little meditative trip through the subtle tier. So as we go through this, most as we go through it, most adults do not get through more than two stages of the subtle tier. So um, I think. 85% of adults, you know, do not. So, you know, it can start to seem stranger and stranger as we go on. Go on the next slide. No, no, next slide. Next slide. That one. That one. Okay. Well, all right. That's not actually where I want to be. Okay, so now, if we close, we'll close your eyes again, we'll try the subtle tier. Um, at the end of the concrete tier, you were focused on the exterior of life, on society, on your role in it. But you begin to notice you have an interior, you have feelings and thoughts. Up to now, you didn't really notice them as objects within you. When you were angry, angry, you were anger. When you were happy, you were happiness. But now you see you have a lot of different experiences arising within you. Gradually over time, your focus shifts to these things instead of the exterior concrete world. But it's difficult. There seem to be no end to feelings, images, and thoughts, and no way to really organize them. They all slide into each other, come up out of the blue. Also, the certainty you had seems to be slipping away. You look for knowledge, for some answers you can depend on, but all you get is opinions. Where is the right answer? Gaining knowledge is important. You are eager to learn and expand to know as much as you can know. Becoming ex expert at something seems like a good idea so that you have a stable base and a kind of identity around your work. If you have been a part of a religious or social group with defined opinions, you now find that you aren't sure you buy into everything they say. A part of you can be arrogant about this. You see more than others. But a part can be a little terrified. What if you don't fit in anymore? What if you are wrong? God is also a little confusing. He can't be a single being or look on from a single place, maybe more of a cloud or something like air. Otherwise, how can God be omnipresent? But after a time, these ideas that have been flooding you begin to seem useful. You're beginning to prioritize them, separate them out, 
and focus on certain ones. Organization and planning becomes important. You are eager to take this kind of broader thinking you have developed and put it into practice to create things for yourself in your private life and at work. You want to be the best you can be. If people would just stop putting up roadblocks, you could get a lot done. You can now distinguish emotions from thoughts, and you tend to prioritize thinking over feeling. Rationality becomes important. You're looking for clarity and precision and direction. You become impatient with a rule-bound, role-bound world. Merit clearly wins out over seniority or position. You define yourself now as more than just a body, more than just a societal role. You identify with your thoughts, your plans, your dreams. Group think is not for you. You want the freedom to think for yourself. God, if he exists, is more of a rational God, one who created a universe that runs by natural laws that can be discovered. Science and the scientific method are marvelous tools for uncovering truth. Analysis and objective thinking can be applied to a lot of problems, if only everyone could see that. You're impatient with both the rigidness of fundamentalism and also with the woo-woo-ness of much New Age thinking. You're not sure if there's a personal God. You notice that every football team prays to win, but God only seems to answer half of them. A lot of traditional belief systems seem ridiculous, though if it comforts somebody to believe in them, then religion is useful. The phrase, religion is the opiate of the masses, might capture your thinking. You are interested in success and enjoy the material comforts that come with that though you are concerned that you not be driven wholly by material wants. But as you continue to examine beliefs and opinions and theories, you begin to see that the context in which they exist has a lot to do with whether or not they make sense. There is not so much right or wrong as right or wrong in context. Different ideas and customs are to be respected. Everything is relative. You're drawn to a social constructivist philosophy, which holds that each of us is who we are because of multiple influences, upbringing, culture, environment. What is best for one person is not always best for everyone. You care now about the entire planet, in particular the natural world, and are often very disturbed by cruelty to vulnerable people, to other species, and to the planet. You feel annoyed by the rational focus and insensitivity of Western culture. You may take an interest in foreign cultures, observing some of the better ways they manage social and environmental problems. You see the importance of really relating to others at a deeper level. Not only do you see that others have beliefs and assumptions, but you know they see that you do too. You begin to see the slipperiness of these beliefs and assumptions and look for consensus as a means of validation. Sharing feelings and ideas, this interior depth, is valuable. Other perspectives can help you to understand the world and yourself. And understanding yourself becomes an important quest. You find yourself drawn to books and workshops and classes that can help you mine your interior, to rid yourself of unhelpful patterns of behavior, to spirituality, which you now see as an interior experience. It also draws you. You long for inner connection as much as outer. You may see yourself as containing multiple people, each with an agenda, often not the same one. You might feel fragmented by these inner voices, like the outer conflicts you see, and long for wholeness and peace. Your God is a metaphysical one, a God that can be understood more through symbolism and metaphor than through literally interpreted texts and rote practices. God may be seen as nature, the web of life. You are part of this God like everything else in creation. Equality, harmony, love, mutual care and understanding are what you seek. And now, after more time passes, Not only do you relate to others through shared feelings and thoughts, but you begin to see how your minds and theirs are beginning to interpenetrate. You realize that what you bring to the table, your feelings, thoughts, ideas, and understanding, is limited and partial, and you see how you need others to bring the other parts. While you used to see those of opposite opinions as misguided, you now seek them out as missing parts of the puzzle, as missing parts of yourself. You see the need to work with not just individual pieces of things, but whole interconnected systems. You want to create from this perspective systems, solutions, programs, whatever. You enjoy maps and hierarchies because they help you to make sense of large systems. You become not just a problem finder, but a problem solver. You again prefer rationality over emotion. Finding functional solutions is more important than raising issues. You find yourself sometimes a little annoyed with tear-jerking pictures of polar bears and people who want everything to be harmony and sweetness, although you appreciate their input. 
and see the need for a heart-oriented perspective in what you and others do. You see yourself as a wide-ranging body-mind. There are few boundaries to your ability to mentally range over time and space. Every event or thing or idea contains so much. You don't just see a chemical plant polluting a river. You see its history, its place in the systems of agriculture, commerce, government, the people and policies who have created and maintained it, the possibilities for growth and change. Even a chair is not only about a thing to sit on, but the materials that made it, the history of its development, and the potential future it has. You see a world in a grain of sand, almost like shape-shifting. You realize that all of these aspects of a problem have to be considered and integrated, that everyone has to be brought into the solution. Your psyche becomes increasingly transparent to you. You find yourself becoming clear of many of the confusions you have. Stuck areas jump out to be healed. You can see your own projections. Psychological insights are common. You no longer feel fragmented. Your body-mind works as an integrated oneness. Your spirituality is much broader. You no longer equate nice and loving with spiritual. You recognize the need to conclude all of the self. God now seems not to fit with even, in, even within the thought systems that have explained him or her before. There are so many aspects to God, vastness, I vowness, the self as God, God as awareness. So that is the subtle tier, hopefully how it feels like inside. So as you could see, it's a lot more complex. <laughs> this is how things tend to interweave. Um, the first stage of this um, subtle tier is the, uh, basically the thinker. It's the, uh, um, this is where things have no concrete reference. You can go inside and think. Here you can see the difference between school and education, between car and transportation. And you're frustrated by it, but you don't know exemplify that. I'm mad as hell, and I'm not going to take it anymore, but where do you go with that? But there's also the fear, if I say something, will I be accepted? Um, and also, we get, says, I think, therefore I am confused. <laughs> this is my favorite slide. Uh, so we get flooded with experiences from the interior. In fact, the beginning of each tier is very disorienting and difficult. Um, so there are too many ideas to prioritize. So people go looking for experts. In fact, this stage is sometimes called the expert. Um, and you look for logic, expertise, problem solving. And often people are perfectionists at this stage because they're not really clear on what's good enough, so they just keep working endlessly to get it better and better and better. 38% uh, of adults tend to be in this stage. So along with the next stage, this stage and the next stage is almost all of the adult world. You're going to find people in this, these two stages. Um, so the next one, this is Terry uses numbers as a way of getting away from, you know, defined words. But uh, you remember this is the orange stage. This is the achiever and the rational stage. And this person has become able to manage and uh, prioritize ideas. They can use ideas to achieve goals, and they stretch action and goal achievement. And you don't realize what a big jump this is from just being in this confused state to being able to take these subtle things and work with them. So by now, you can see five years into the future. And planning and achieving goals is a daily experience. It's not something strange that you might do once every three months. It just happens. People can make a good manager. Uh, they can see more than one perspective. So now they've got options. You know, should we do it this way or should we do it this way? But they still tend to prefer their own ideas. And that, I don't know if you want me to read it. It's, it's from The Pursuit of Happiness, if any of you saw that movie. Um, he says, don't ever let someone tell you you can't do something, not even me. You've got a dream, you've got to protect it. When people can't do something themselves, they're going to tell you you can't do it. You want something, go get it, period. So it's that kind of approach to life. And here's another phrase that I think um, would fit with that stage. Fill the unforgiving minute with 60 seconds worth of distance room. Run, run. Don't lose an opportunity to do something to make yourself better. Um, at this stage, people can think about thinking and feeling. Their, uh, their feeling thoughts and their feelings become objects to them. Uh, they want to control them, so they're looking for self-mastery. They, they're not looking outside for somebody else to set the rules and control them. They're looking to, have to do that for themselves. 
Uh, they value rational thought, independent action, and science and research to help decide what is the best course of action. Uh, this is 30% of adults. Um, so at this point, we have 17% in the concrete tier and um, about 70% in the first two stages of the subtle tier. So there are only 13% left who go beyond that ever in their lives. So it gives you a sense of probably where most of our society is. So the next stage um, is the green, green sensitive self. Uh, this is a heart-centered self. It's about harmony, peace, about tolerance, about human rights, social responsibility, making a difference, sustainability, diversity, other cultures, primitive cultures become of interest, care for the environment. <clears throat> this group tends to be egalitarian, and they reject categorization and hierarchy and seek consensus. <clears throat> Another way this stage expresses itself is the interiors. The unexamined life is not worth living. So they're very interested in self-examination, looking at the interior voices. They begin to distinguish between their ego and their higher self. There's still some difficulty knowing where that voice is coming from. Is it, you know, am I deceiving myself into thinking it's my ego self or is it really my higher self? And the shadow, shadow investigation becomes very important at this stage. And there's also an appreciation for the larger forces of history and, and environment. Um, so in this Casablanca scene, they're saying all the problems of three little people don't amount to a hill of beans in this crazy world. So they're, they're beginning to subordinate themselves to the an understanding that there are things much, much larger than them. They, all, they can get passionately involved in a cause. They can give themselves up for others. But often people at this stage are overwhelmed and despairing. Why, why don't good people win? Why, you know, why do we have all these problems? So this is about 10% of the population. Now, there's a big difference between living from this stage and mouthing this stage. I mean, you might find a lot of teenagers out there you know, going on and on about recycling, but they don't live from this sense of context and... Um, and an understanding of the interiors that, that a person who actually lives from this stage does. So our, our world now has a whole bunch of green phrases out there. You turn on the television and every company is talking about how green they are and how they do stuff. But, you know, but to really live from this level and to really care for the people is a very advanced stage you know, to get to this place where it's really coming from inside. And then the last... One. Now, this is interesting because those of you who know Ken's work know that he starts second tier. At, he breaks between green and teal. He calls it teal or strategist or yeah, yellow, which is the spiral dynamics. He says that's where the big leap comes. Now, there's a big leap at each one of these stages, but there's an even greater one. But he, uh, Terry O'Fallon keeps this within the subtle stage because you're still dealing with these subtle ideas. You're still dealing with your interior. Um, but at this point, you can understand and work with really complex systems, systems of systems. You have a picture of long past, long future. You could go out and create the Cosmos series, for example, if you've been watching that. Um, not just watch it. Uh, there's your strategic, critical thinker. The Dalai Lama said, uh, when asked what was the most important thing in the world today, he said critical thinking. <laughs> You'd think he would say love. Um, <coughs> People at this stage tend to prioritize reason over emotion. Uh, they're grounded and practical, and they're aware of the limits of their own knowledge. So this is an example of the thinking. Everything is interconnected, and you know, it's not just a linear thing. There's just multiple uh, aspects of things affecting each other. And they can build beautiful, complex things. Uh, that involve multiple systems. I mean, we've got, oops. Okay. Um, here we have political systems, technical systems, environmental systems, architectural systems, air patterns to take into account, seismic patterns to take into account. And they involve everybody in them. So it's not just the people who need the building and use the people, the building. It's 
business people, financial people, governments, um, all of those have to be taken into account when you build something with that kind of complexity. Um, another thing is that the interior becomes increasingly transparent and people take their projections back. Instead of, it's his fault, it's like, what part of me is being expressed here? So this guy looks at himself in the mirror. The other two blame themselves. Um, <clears throat> So this, this level enjoys paradox, actually enjoys paradox, doesn't struggle with paradox. Uh, they look for uniqueness rather than superiority or inferiority. They tend to be very optimistic. The green stage is a very pessimistic stage, but the next stage up is optimistic. And this is about 4% of the population. Um, so here's a, a chart I put together. You can't read it, I'm sorry. But anyway, the, the most, of, most of the world is here. Well, most of the world outside of this country is probably down here. Um, the Western world has moved. And some of the uh, Scandinavian countries, are, there's a lot, you know, they're moving more into green. Um, so we'll talk a little bit at the end about what moves people from stage to stage, but education helps a lot. And disorienting dilemmas, when you run into a situation in your life and you think, oh my God, nothing I think right now or do right now is going to solve this problem. Where am I going to go? And those are the sorts of things that push you on. Um, it also helps when there are more people in a society because there's somewhere to go. You're not facing a jungle and thinking, where do I put the path? Somebody's already created the path. So if you get to this stage, there's a clear path to follow, to become an achiever, to, go, to get into orange. And there's beginning to become a path to get into green. After that, it becomes very difficult. So people will grow in societies as far as they can. And so it becomes a kind of a center of gravity of a society until people have laid down um, stages beyond it. So, all right, so I want to do my last little reading, and this is on the causal stage. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay. All right, so now if you want to close your eyes again for a few minutes. So now you were at the end of the subtle stage and you were pretty much in control of your interior world, the world of ideas and thoughts. But now you're losing a lot of the clarity you had. Lately, you seem to have become one big, booming, buzzing confusion. Awareness is who you are. Everything rushes into you. Ideas, feelings, images, emptiness, fullness and you rush into everything else. You start one thing, and then another let them go. All the constructs you had in your head seem to be illusory and unimportant. What used to be important isn't anymore. You feel incoherent a lot of the time, inarticulate. You don't seem to know anything, and if you do, you can't speak it about it because you can't capture its complexity in words. Language is seen as inadequate, just another's construction, along with the concrete world and the subtle. How inadequate all the maps are. The map is so clearly not the territory. You are aware of everything, your interior and your exterior, your best and your worst. Your emotions, thoughts, inspirations, and revelations arise unbidden in your awareness. You are aware of your own awareness. You may seek solitude. If you have a meditative practice, it's very helpful at this level. Ultimate questions come into your life. What is existence? Gradually, you work with these new awarenesses, create maps embedded within maps, not just systems working together, but you synchronize whole fields together, like art with technology and spirituality and botany. You create fields into which others can grow. Over time, your individual self fades into the larger self, and finally, both transcendence and imminence are integrated. So I'm going to stop there. That's a very quick run through that one. So this is a picture of maybe what it feels like at the co um, the call of here. Um, and Terry Pellin has the first two stages. The first one's called Construct Aware. Um, and this is when you start to see that everything you have put together, even idea constructions, are 
kind of meaningless. And um, you identify not with your mind anymore, but with the witness. So you're observing um, everything from the witness stage. Substantial state practice helps people get into this stage. Otherwise, it can be very difficult to enter. So meditation becomes very important, as Jose will talk about. Um, there's no more need at this stage to self-actualize. The self is seen more as a conduit. Um, past and future disappear into a more spacious present. And there's a cosmic perspective, the kind of I am that. Whoops, what have I done here? That's something else. Okay, um, you feel like you are everybody. Others are in the self, the self is in others. You see that any meaning imposed is arbitrary and made up. Personal stories are only that, completely fluid, they can change at any moment. And language is very incomplete. So this is a phrase by Walt Whitman, do I contradict myself? Very well, then I contradict myself. I am large, I contain multitudes. And then I love this one as well. Your heart and my heart are very, very old friends. This is by Hafiz. Um, and it becomes this heart-loving presence that sees through it all. But it's, you realize it's the same in every person. So not only are they old friends, but they're actually the same. The hearts are the same. Uh, you're at peace and chaos and see the beauty in things just as they are. Um, and the person at this stage leads by being. And this is 1% uh, in this entire tier, this entire causal tier at 1% of the population. Most of it, obviously, in the first entry stage. Um, so just to run over them again, the concrete, there's some descriptions of what somebody sees. The first thing they do is see these light shade movement. Then they can discriminate, manipulate them, visualize them. Then they realize others can affect them and they can affect them. And then they start interacting around concrete things that's totally ordinary. Um, at the subtle level, that's where somebody becomes aware they have feelings and ideas within them. Uh, they can discriminate against among them, uh, use them in their lives. Then they see the interior lives of other people. They realize they're making assumptions and have opinions. And then interacting around that becomes just commonplace. And then at the causal, there's an awareness of everything all at once. Uh, and then an ability to act on these awarenesses and integrate them. And then the individual recedes into the cosmos, the whole. And then there's nothing but the cosmos at the last of these causal stages. Um, and then at the non-dual, which I'm not going to say a lot because I don't know. <laughs> um, this is where there's the inner penetration of emptiness and form. The self disappears entirely, even the witness self. I think Ken has said that the last stand of the ego is the witness. So the witness finally disappears, and, and instead of the witness experiencing things, only experiencing is left. <clears throat> So um, the problem, the reason about this talk, is when we try to squeeze higher level experience into lower level things. As you can see, these higher level experiences are very what we call spiritual experiences. People are walking around with an ordinary lived experience, which to a person at this level is going to feel really weird. Um, so we can have a state experience at any time. We can whoosh into one of these higher states of consciousness. We can experience it, but we can't hold it. Um, and it can be kind of an, you know, oh shit feeling, <laughs> uh, frightening and destabilizing. Um, so, for example, at the subtle level, it's not strange to hear inner voices. We hear, you know, like, oh God, there's a part of me wants to eat the ice cream, and then there's a part of me that says I shouldn't have it. And, you know, so we know there are all these different voices within us, and we're kind of used to hearing it. But if you hear it here, it's going to feel very strange. Um, I remember my son, when he was seven, walked into the kitchen and he said, Mom, he said, I think, I think school is interfering with my education. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, whoa. Well, you know, I mean, school, yeah, he knew there was a school building, but the idea of the two, education and school together, you know, was, was like a jump. He had, he had somehow had this kind of insight, but there was no way he could hold it and there was no way he could do anything about it. It wasn't, he was, you know, he was living 
here. But still, you can get those insights. And, and I think we all know times when we suddenly get an insight, and it's like, oh my God, I really think I see something, and then it sort of goes away. You know, um, so growing ourselves through these stages allows us to keep those things and hold them. Um, so this is where, oh, okay. So what I want you to do is have a look at this for just a minute or two. So now, think to yourself, what's going on inside me? If I'm thinking, what am I thinking about? Am I having a certain type of experience? And then you might think to yourself, okay, who or what in me is aware of this fire? get a sense of who is aware here. And then imagine what happens if there's no you looking at this fire. So we might have a long time, but those are kind of, you can look at this and you can um, see a fire. Just a plain old fire. That's kind of a concrete experience. You can look into this and you can start having thoughts and feelings and emotions. You can become aware of who is looking at that fire. That's a causal awareness kind of experience. And then if there's no you at all, what is that? That's, there's no fire. <laughs> well, that's true. <laughs> there's no fire. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the big self, the big self, this self is very, very expanded. And each stage, too, is you really expands. You start out with a very narrow view of life, and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until you're holding the whole world. So this big, big, big self cannot fit into this tiny self. So if you get intimations of this, there's nowhere for it to go. But you can grow this self into this very large self that can, in fact, contain all of these experiences. Um, so if you can grow yourself up first... Uh, then you don't have as much disorientation, um, you don't need to be in control, you have the ability to take multiple perspectives, you don't have to work everything out logically. So when these experiences come into being, they're not so disorienting. Also, as you keep growing, you know that growth keeps happening. And so you're not, you're not just you know, surprised by that. Oh, here I am seeing something differently now, and I will, I know, you know, next year or the year after or five years from now, I'll see it again differently. So the final stages are lived realities, not just experiences. People do walk around in those spaces. Um, so advantages of growing up, we want to grow from people who are self-absorbed and self-gratifying, the people who can work and live with others and follow rules, that's a concrete level, to people who can question rules, to people who can envision and design systems under which we can all live, that would be a strategist level, or to people whose being creates fields in which people can flourish. And we want to grow from people who are blind about their inner lives, their motivations, their projections, to people who know their personalities and their projections who see others as themselves and who have compassion and wisdom. And we want to grow from people who have a limited space-time perspective to those who can take into account the entire evolution of the universe of time and space. And from people who are conscious of their physical environment to people who are conscious of their minds, to people who are conscious of their own awareness, to people who are awareness. So some of the ways that we can grow that self, and I've taken these from many, many different people, including um, Barrett Brown and Suzanne Kogreuter and Ken, um, 
But one of the first ones is to have an intention to grow. Um, a lot of people are happy where they are. And that's just <laughs> fine, you know, if you're kind of content. That's great. <laughs> Stay here. But if you want to grow, you know, you need an intention. You need to keep taking perspectives, more and more and more perspectives. So whenever something happens to you, take your own perspective and then try out a few others. Um, immerse yourself in complexity. And this can seem like, oh my God, you know, I need more complexity in this world today. But um, that's an important growth factor. Uh, investigate yourself. You know, try to purify whatever you know, inner demons you've got that are causing yourself trouble and other people around you. Question everything, especially what you think is true. So whatever it is that you believe, start questioning that and see where it takes you. Uh, seek out relationships with wise and spiritual people. That's from Roger Walsh, who suggested that one. Explore inner states and meditate. Um, meditation is fund fundamental. Um, because it deals with each of these levels, and Jose is going to go into a lot of detail about this. But first of all, you have to relax the concrete body, concentrate on a concrete object or idea. Um, you need to have, a, now in your subtle stage, a kind of an alertness to these various things appearing in your consciousness. Imperturbability, you need to be able to accept what is in both the concrete exterior and subtle interior. So if you're sitting down to meditate and somebody starts a pneumatic drill, that's the problem in the exterior to accept what it is. Or you start thinking about, oh my God, what am I going to do with my mother? She's going to, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's an interior um, thing that you need to become imperturbable about. Um, if you can, <laughs> that's the growth process. Um, and then you have awareness, uh, awareness as a stage, and then finally inquiry in the origin of the self. And Jose will talk about these in more detail. So I just want to finish with a poem that, to me, says something about the importance of growing up and how important it is maybe to do that first. So if we assume Ithaca as a metaphor for awakening, um, it says, I'm going to have to read it from here. Yeah. When you set out for Ithaca, ask that your way be long, full of adventure, full of instruction. Have Ithaca always in your mind. Your arrival there is what you are destined for. But don't in the least hurry the journey. Better it last for years, so that when you reach the island, you are old, rich with all you have gained on the way, not expecting Ithaca to give you wealth. Ithaca gave you a splendid journey. Without her, you would not have set out. She hasn't anything else to give you. And if you find her poor, Ithaca hasn't deceived you. So wise you have become of such experience that already you have understood what these Ithacas mean. Okay, so that's all I have. Thank you. Well, thank you.